Today's guest is Dr. Haroldo Magarinos. He's a Chilean dentist specializing in periodontics, oral medicine, and, and implantology. That's definitely not where he stopped in his career. So after a decade of conventional practice and university teaching, he decided to pursue his passion and become a board certified naturopathic doctor in 2018. He also specializes in integrative biological dental medicine, homeopathy, live blood analysis, peptide therapy, and advanced clinical ozone therapy. So you guys can see why I invited him on the show because this is all really freaking cool. Um, Dr. Geraldo has long been a strong advocate for studying the human microbiome, firmly believing that treating patients with dysbiosis can prevent and even reverse many prevalent forms of chronic disease. I completely agree. Um, he currently works as a clinical consultant in microbiome metagenomic analysis for microbiome labs, which is how I met him, um, and is co-founder and director of Revolution Gut Health, an online platform that teaches, sorry, that offers coaching services to everyone who wants to learn and improve microbiome related health conditions. So he does both works with people on their gut microbiomes, and he also educates other health professionals um, to learn more about this. And that's how I met him is because I've been using microbiome labs stool analyses with my clients and he is one of the naturopaths that they allow us as practitioners to um, have a call with with a naturopath and I was just so blown away by him I was like thank you for educating me so much on so many things um, and I just had to have him come on the podcast especially because he has that background in biological dentistry and he's I mean he told me that he's done over 2000, he said, he, I think he said he stopped counting at 2000 stool analyses. So he's like really on the front end of everything going on with the microbiome and then has the background in the oral microbiome too. And I was just like, oh my gosh, come talk to my people. So um, we'll go ahead and jump in. Make sure you hit his website, revolutiongutthealth.com if you want more help from him. And then you can find him on Instagram. It's at Dr. Just D-R Haroldo. That's H-A-R-O-L-D-O. -O. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Here is Dr. Haroldo Magarinos. Okay. So my first question is somebody's listening to this podcast right now. They just kicked it on. They're like in their car or they're going for a walk and they're minding their own business. They're not maybe somewhat into health a little bit, you know, why should they care in your opinion? Why should they care about, let's start with the oral. Why should they give a crap about their oral microbiome? Or maybe they've never even heard what that is. And they're like, why should they care? Why should they be aware of like the bacteria situation going on in their mouth? That's an excellent question. Um, the oral microbiome is the second most, most diverse ecosystem in, in our body after the gut. And it's tightly connected. This is literally seeing the same thing, but on a different, uh, from another end. Uh, this is mm -hmm. um, completely integrated and communicated with the gut microbiome. And everyone is concerned about the gut microbiome and all the relationships that we see with uh, different types of health conditions, but we're not uh, looking at one of the major components that is driving the health status of the gut microbiome, which is the oral microbiome. Mm -hmm. So if you have an imbalanced oral microbiome in whatever means uh, possible, that's gonna have a direct influence on your gut microbiome status. And maybe all the work that you're doing trying to get that area of your body better is not going to go so far because you have that fundamental blockage that is an imbalance in the oral microbiome. Okay. So let's go off like basic symptomology. What are some signs that you might be have something going on with your oral microbiome? We'll start just um, basic that way. Yeah. Um, first of all, we basic things, um, inflammation that you can see uh, from, from uh, daily, daily routine uh hygiene habits like uh seeing blood in your in your in your uh saliva uh when from you're flossing seeing, or from flossing or from mm -hmm. tooth brushing that's mm -hmm. a critical sign that that's something mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. um the other uh, sign that you will see is halitosis bad yeah. breath mm -hmm. that's m telling you that we're breaking things uh more than we should or we're breaking more of some things that can make these gases and this off gassing in the mouth that you can tell by by the the breath mm -hmm. um those are very clear symptoms um dry mouth is another very important mm. one. dry mouth uh can be telling you that your salivary glands salivary glands are not working properly and that will drive mm -hmm. imbalances in the oral microbiome directly so we have 
Yeah. Those two, you, I think those are the, well, some of the most important ones. Okay. And then what about like in terms of things, big reasons that people end up getting, I mean, I know it's a really, it's like, why do people get sick? It's like, oh my gosh, but like just big hitters on the oral microbiome that people might want to be aware of that cause the biggest problems. Yes. Um, the oral microbiome relies first on the gut microbiome status to be healthy. And that's something that is just be in touch, like very mm-hmm. superficially with uh, very recent information that we, we have from um, uh, some research that has been done in terms of the nutrients that we absorb on the, on the gut, that they get recirculated into the salivary glands. And that's how the microbiome on the, on the mouth gets their nutrients. Mm-hmm. So it's super important, that factor, that we have a well-fed oral microbiome, and that relies on digestive pathways in our gut microbiome. Second of all, the way we breathe. Mm -hmm. Our breathing patterns are crucial. If you breathe by the mouth, if you have a sinus uh, infection or there's allergies going on, people who snore or even worse, sleep apnea will drive different type of patterns of compositions in the oral microbiome. Mm -hmm. And those patterns usually are associated with more inflammation and a higher risk of getting pathological conditions in the mouth. Mm. So those are two. Of course, the third one is actually a little bit contradictory with, uh, contradicts the the standard narrative that we hear that you have to brush your teeth at least three times a day and floss regularly. Mm -hmm. Actually, Mm over-cleansing can drive more aggressive patterns and can deplete some healthy microbes that we need to function and also to be protected. So we have, it's very easy to get this idea that our microbes are driving disease and they're yeah. there, they're present for making us sick. They're all bad. <laughs> and they're all bad. And these evil guys with, with yeah. <laughs> horns yeah. and tails trying to make us sick. And the reality is that 99% of them, they're actually benign. They're either protecting us or at least they're not doing something wrong for us. So Mm -hmm. depleting in a constant basis basis or damaging our microbiome uh, intentionally using antimicrobials coming in mouthwashes or chemicals in toothpaste, toothpaste, like fluoride, for example, and other additives they use. Um, Titanium dioxide is another big one in toothpaste. Um, That's going to affect the microbiome of the mouth. And it, it will have a direct implication on how protected, how stable is our microbiome to resist any other type of opportunistic infection, and also how our microbiome will behave. Yeah, yeah. Things we'll be doing. Okay, in case people are like not sure on the fence, toothpaste, fluoride or fluoride-free. Your thoughts? <laughs> My <laughs> opinion. Yeah, and this is a big discussion, yeah. but. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm against fluoride. I, I think fluoride <laughs> has a um, cumulative effect on the body and promotes calcification in certain areas of the brain. Mm-hmm. And it has been recognized as a neurotoxin. Yeah. Same category like ars- arsenic, for example, for example. So it's not even my thoughts. There's plenty of research categorizing right. Right. <laughs> right, on, on, that, on that level. Yeah. Right. So uh, the the reality is that because we think the dosing is too small, it will not create that damage. But what we're not considering is the cumulative effect, exposing our bodies three times per day while we're tooth brushing or to using a fluoride toothpaste. That's going to have a cumulative effect over time that will have an exponential effect on our health. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now we're, we're in the oral microbiome. We're going down to the gut microbiome. And I, I mean, I got it. So I'm sure I'll say in the intro, but like uh, you've been doing the, the analyses. That's what I love about microbiome labs. I'm like, shoot, I get a, a consult with a naturopath. Like this is awesome. And I was just really blown away by how knowledgeable you said you've done like at least a couple thousand of these analyses yes. now. Yes. Ah, it's, I, it's just like, Cause it's so new. It's pretty new. You know, I mean, we've been doing GI mapping, but I'm talking in the, in the course of human health, 
Like this is a really new field and you've been like just completely immersed in it. And I'm just curious, you know, for the average person, let's say maybe they haven't done a stool test, right? That's what we're talking about guys is like, yes, you got to like send in a little sample of your poo. One of my, one of my clients said that was humbling. (laughs) Yeah. Worth it. Um, What are some like patterns that you've noticed in terms of um, like nutrition for people to be aware of. Cause I know I've had some humbling moments of like, oh my gosh, I need to be rethinking how I'm making nutrition recommendations. So, so what are, what are some big patterns you've noticed? Well, um, there's a lot of trending diets out there and now the, the patterns of, of nutrition are quite diverse. And I think what we have been in a way, um, it has been a positive thing because we have been able to analyze very extreme conditions in both sides, like an absolute um, uh, absence of, uh, for example, meat and dairy products in our diet. And on the other side, an excessive amount of them and without uh, the intake of carbohydrates. Uh, So basically we need to feed everything. (laughs) We are a quite resilient machinery and we have... Mm -hmm a tremendous amount of microbes related to different pathways. But the reality in a very basic way is that we absorb and we use certain nutrients directly. And it's usually related to the to, to the proteins and fats and water and certain vitamins that can be absorbed along with, of course, refined carbs. All of those, they can be absorbed directly on the small bowel, mainly. Mm-hmm. And then we have the large intestine. And that is related to fermentation mainly. And for fermentation, we need carbohydrates. We don't really need to ferment too much proteins and definitely not fats. Mm -hmm. What we mainly need to to feed there is our microbes that we we have plenty of them. I'm talking about Mm -hmm. 100 trillion at least of them living in that area of the body. And 70 to 80% of them, they rely on complex carbs to be fed, and then they will make things that makes us healthy, like tortuin fatty acids and neurotransmitters, things we really need. But we make we need to first um, feed them in order for them to make whatever we need. And if we go and just feed our body directly with proteins and fats, yes, we're gonna be feeding a very important part of our physiology, but we're gonna be missing a huge piece. And a lot of the narrative about those uh, extreme diets is that they you get a lot of nutrients directly to your cells, but we are more microbes than human cells. So we can forget that we need those microbes to be fed properly as well. And that's a huge, huge, huge deal. So when it comes to nutrition, what we need, we need both. We need a good absorption of proteins, in the small bowel, we need good healthy fats. We need um, our, of course, our daily intake of water, and we need the complex carbs to feed the 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 microbiome of the gut as well, so they can make all these tartin fatty acids and other nutrients. What are some potential concerns for you know? Because obviously, I'm specialized in keto, so I may have some carnivore diet or listeners, and like you know, I always think of these people that like maybe they had some overgrowth and then they did, you know, carnivore and they're not feeding certain bacteria and they feel like a million times better and not like, I, I, I'm not saying they're all in this, but I know some of y'all are in this. It's like this, like now I feel kind of stuck in this because every single time I try to eat anything else, like it's a total S show for no no pun intended. (laughs) Um, So like, what are some potential concerns for people doing like long-term term carnivore dieting or something along that basically all animal, Based product diet. Uh, There's um, there's plenty actually. I I um, the the problem is that yes, you can get a lot of benefits and nutrients and uh, directly to your body by eating healthy quantities and 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 good quality meats. I'm I'm will never say that you can't. uh, There there's no benefits there. Mm -hmm. The problem is that um, when you do that too much, you push that to to the extreme you are pushing also your digestive pathways. So they, because you rely on them to break down these proteins, this piece of steak you're putting in your mouth and chewing Mm -hmm. needs to be broken down to a very small level 
So it can go through the gut lining and it can be utilized and arrive into your cells. So then you get the benefits out of it. Mm -hmm. But that requires that your stomach acid production has to be top notch, that your enzyme production has to be operating properly. Your whole body metabolism has to be optimal. And -hmm. especially if you go super high in protein intake, if you're eating 20, 30 grams of protein, you might be able to deal with those pretty easily. But when you're pushing carnivore diets, when they're recommending 1.1 to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of weight, that actually is a lot. It's a lot to handle. And mm-hmm. and and depending on the personal variables in terms of our, our digestive efficiency, we might not get so much benefits. Because if you don't break down those proteins properly enough, you're going to get waste. And that waste byproducts are coming from partially digested proteins that were not able to be absorbed on the small bowel, they're going to become endotoxic. They're going to hurt your gut lining, your Mm -hmm. own body's tissues. And also they will arrive into the colon. And now they're not going to get fermented. They're not going to get absorbed. Sorry, they're going to get fermented. Mm -hmm. And fermentation, excessive fermentation of proteins leads to a production of a lot of things we need to avoid in, in excessive amounts like hydrogen sulfide, methane, phenols, ammonia, et cetera. Mm-hmm. All of these molecules in large amounts are inflammatory. So now instead of getting benefits from that high intake of protein, you're mm-hmm. getting a lot of inflammation. Mm. Now, of course, people get benefits at the beginning because they're eliminating other things that are actually mm-hmm. very bad for us. Mm-hmm. But it, it works more as an elimination diet than getting a lot of benefits because of this high amount of protein intake you're getting. You're eating. Yeah. I would love to see like, I don't know, 50 people who are deep in carnivore diet, you know, like at, at one year, two year, three, I would love to see their stool analyses and just see what we're working with. Cause that's kind of a new thing. Right. And so are these kind of tests, like at the level that we have them now. So, okay. Thanks for explaining that. Cause yeah, that I heard, um, Quran, you know, from mm-hmm. microbiome labs on a podcast once talking about like, yeah, if you do an extreme diet like that, you may get some upregulation of a lot of things, but like like any extreme, you're also downregulating. You're not feeding a whole bunch of these good guys. So it's like you feel better at first. That's how every pendulum swing is that way. I think that's why a lot of people feel good on just regular keto if they had, you know, metabolic syndrome <laughs> and you're just eating standard American diet, never working out. They go into this pendulum swing where they're not eating any of the garbage anymore, which I like your point. It's like a lot of it's like kind of like an elimination diet of all the crap and you're working out, like you're going to feel way better. But then eventually, I mean, to me, all you have to do is look at nature. It's like, look, look, there's all of it. There's all of it for us. You can have all of it, but I I get a time and a place for a pendulum swing, you know, like people can go on their journey the way they want, but staying in a, the far end of an extreme it's just, I, you know, from my point of view, in terms of all of the health markers I'm looking at from your point of view and the stool test you're looking at, you're saying basically it's like, it's not the greatest idea to stay in a super extreme diet for a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't agree with that. Um, <laughs> I, I think that we have all uh, become resilient just because we were able to grab uh, yeah. every single aspect of nature um, and bring it into, into our body and that will become energy and mm-hmm. it will become um, it will become uh, light for for our needs. And we're feeding uh, ultimately we're feeding uh, uh, we'll, we're feeding either cells from microbes or cells from from our body. And all of them they rely on on energy sources. And en- energy can be produced in multiple f- ways. If you put one source only, yeah, that can work. But we have this philosophy as humans, like, okay, something can be good. So let's amplify that to 10 times more. And now it's not a good thing anymore. Just start (laughs) becoming a bad thing. So too much of a good thing, you know, that's a school saying uh, can become a bad thing. I think that we do that so well. We do that with probiotics. We do that with supplements. We do that with diet when it's proven. The best diet for the body is the one that keeps us resilient. Mm -hmm. A little bit of everything from good quality, from good source. Mm -hmm. Now, all these diets, vegan and and, and carnivore, they rely on a food transportation system. 
Mm. Unless you live in the tropical, in the tropical weather, you're not going to have fruits available 24-7 the whole right. year round. Right. You, you will eat seasonally and things show off and, and show on in, in different sta- stages of the year. And whenever you don't have the available, I don't think that you have a large intestine just for eating seasonal fruits three times a, a three months a year. That's it. That huge apparatus is not sustain, is not there just to sustain three months of seasonal eating of fruits. That is for a constant exposure to carbohydrates. Yeah. So, I don't know about you, but if food was scarce, I'd be like storing up potatoes like a mother <laughs> all winter long. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that actually is a, in some cultures, that's an amazing source of nutrients. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a potato if, fan. <laughs> if you have a proper digestive agony, your digestive fire or agony, as, it, as it's called in Ayurvedic medicine, but if you have a proper digestive efficiency, that will make anything into something useful. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, we'll see, cause I'm getting ready to do my, I haven't done my own stool test and I'll probably book my consult with you. And I, I don't know, but all I know is I'm like, thank you little gut microbes. You guys are doing such an amazing job. Cause like nothing messes me up ever. Like it's, it's like unbelievable to me. And that I think about that. And I'm like, when I hear people say, Oh, I ate, you know, carbs are bad for you. <clears throat> I ate this unripe banana and, or the, you know, all these things happen to me. And I'm like, bro, like, I don't mean to be a jerk, but I can eat like a whole freaking cookie sheet of cauliflower and nothing happens to me. So I don't mean to be like braggy or something, but like, obviously I got something helping me break that down that you don't got going in there. Not necessarily, but we start to label these foods. Like that. that's the messaging coming out to the general public is like, these things are bad for you. And it's like, to me, it's just like, no, it just really seems like you, you're not digesting that well. And a lot of people have digestive issues. I mean, as I'm sure you've seen, you know, it's very common now. And actually I kind of do want to trans like turn into that a little bit. I mean, are you not seeing like a lot of digestive issues coming through on these stool tests, right? I mean, obviously people are taking this stool test most likely because they're having some digestive issues, but like, what do you chalk up to all the digestive issues that we're experiencing now? Um, it, it's, it's trending. Uh, you, you, yeah, yeah. As you mentioned that that's, um, uh, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, yeah. And it's not because we're testing more. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, because, because we have more tools for now diagnosing. No, the diagnosis actually is pretty erratic. Um, most of the symptoms associated with the different conditions are pretty much the same. You see the, the description of IBS or IBD yeah. or leaky gut or SIBO right. pretty much looks the same. So I think we're looking at just one main problem that might have some slight differences, and that's why we use them different terminology, but the main issue here is that we are directly affecting our gut microbiome, our, and of course, on the side, our digestive pathways by all the modifications we have been doing over the last 50 years to the farming industry mm-hmm. and to the food uh, processing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are depleting the soil from nutrients. We're contaminating and polluting the water and the very basics that will bring nutrients and energy to our foods. Right. Um, no matter the source you're looking at, I mean, I don't mind if it's animal or plant-based, still is polluted and damaged mm-hmm. to a certain extent. And sadly, this is widely spread all across the country and on the globe. Mm-hmm. And because of that reason, we're seeing that our body is not getting enough and our microbiome is suffering. Our Mm -hmm. digestive pathways are suffering. And now we have a very trending problem because we are stressing, heavily stressing, a very important part of our body Mm -hmm. to do something that was naturally doing when all these other nutrients and all these other components were in place. Now we are missing major things in our diet. And we expect to get results and be optimal what when we're putting like probably the lowest quality of fuel in our gas right. tank. Uh, right. And we expect that we should be running like a Ferrari. I, I, we, 
we need to provide the right nutrients, the right energy, so we can perform in an optimal level. And um, that comes from the very basics. Mm -hmm. Now, if the very basics are gone or lower in quality, I don't know where we're going to be able to compensate. But now everyone is in the multivitamin. You see that. Why? Why? My grandma didn't take a multivitamin. Right. Only my mother, for most of her years, she didn't took a multivitamin either. Now everyone is in the multivitamin. And everyone is struggling trying to get their nutritional levels optimal. Mm-hmm. And what was the main difference? My grandma ate a lot of things that probably are not even recommendable, <laughs> not even healthy. Yeah. But there was way more nutri- nutrient yeah. density. Yeah. And there was way less pollutants. Yeah. So, yes. That's so true. And, and you're right. It's funny. I just ordered some Quicksilver Scientific uh, Ultra Vitamin this morning, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm in the same, I'm like looking at all the data from this, or, or the nutrient density, even organic food. Like, okay, it's organic, but it probably still had some pesticides blown onto those, you know, the GMO seeds mix in or whatever, you can't control it. And then, but it's mostly the soil. Like if it's not grown on a regenerative, even the regenerative farms that are few and far between praise all of you. If any of you are listening, doing that work, it is like some of the most important work on the planet right now, but even those they're still working to get that nutrient density back up, you know? Um, but like, yeah, that's the question is like, okay, we have this huge problem. I am Jessica, who's 31 years old, who lives in California. What do I do? <laughs> what are my best practices to, to to do the best with the world that I find myself in now? What would you say to her? Oh, uh, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> right? I wish I have a perfect answer. Um, I'm looking forward to find it. But um, so far, I will say that there's two fundamental things that I will recommend. Of course, do an effort, the same effort you do for other things. Do your best to find what the best available sources of foods. And that will be more into things that were locally produced, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things that were not transported from thousands of miles, um, fresh product products, um, locally products, and, and, and hopefully seasonal. Um, that would be one big recommendation. And the other one, work on your digestive efficiency. Mm -hmm. Because let's say for a moment, you're not getting the best quality or the right source, but your um, digestive efficiency is optimized. Mm -hmm. You might be able to get the best of what you're putting in your body, even if it's not high quality. You're going to squeeze the last drop because your chemical structures like your fluids, your enzymes are going to be working Mm -hmm. to get the most out of that. But if you have low digestive capacity, low digestive efficiency, even with the best food, you're not going to get much. Mm -hmm. So people are focusing so much in foods, Mm -hmm. they're forgetting that this machinery we have, this engine that is need, needs to process everything and break it down needs to operate in a in a very high performance to get what we need okay i know this is like it's the more you individual labs you see and the more you individually work with people like as a, as an nd it's like so hard to answer questions generally right because it's like I, it depends but when somebody hears that like okay improve my digestive efficiency like are there any general recommend practices, recommendations, you know, or is it just go get a test with a naturopath or, you know, something like we do with microbiome labs or like, what would you recommend for somebody to make sure that they're maintaining healthy digestive efficiency or building better digestive efficiency? Yeah, there, there are definitely things that we, uh, we can do that are pretty simple, but for some reason we start forgetting about those. Uh, yeah. First of all, chew your foods. hmm if you chew, you're going to have a very important improvement in the enzymes you're providing. The, the, you're going to make the stomach functioning way easier. Uh, it's going to, the stomach uh, performance is going to be optimized because you're already pre-digest everything in your, in your mouth. Um, 
And I like to add to that one, savor your food, right? Because if I think of like chew my food, sometimes I'm like chore, you know, but if, if you, if you're savoring, it just happens naturally. Just taste it. Savor it. <laughs> I thought, anyway, just I, 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 no. I'm a, I'm a big uh, passionate of of cooking. Um, mm. I've been all my life like that. I didn't That's even awesome. know how important it was. But um, mm. uh, I I I love to cook my foods, and I I spend decent amount of time every day in the kitchen. Um, That's awesome. That relationship you create with your foods yeah. actually will improve your digestive pathways. Mm. If you're smelling. Everything in yeah. advance. You're literally telling your body, food is coming. Right. And this is the nature of food that I'm going to be putting in my in my body. So get prepared. And then you yeah. see your salivary glands, your all yeah. autonomic nervous system, everything is flashing, waiting right. for that food to arrive. <laughs> um, so the anticipation actually is a great thing. And like you were saying, enjoying your meals. And mm-hmm. give yourself time. I, I remember the first time um, um, I come from, of course, <laughs> from a different country. You, you you know that already. And we take our time, not because we're lazy, just because there's a cultural um, uh, acceptance of how important food is. And so awesome. 45 minutes, an hour in between our morning uh, schedule and the afternoon schedule. So, so we take awesome. an hour break to eat. You see that a lot in France and Italy and Europe mm. in general. Mm-hmm. They take an hour break. Mm-hmm. Here, the first time I started working was 10 minutes. Or in, in some cases, it was like, whenever you find some time, go and grab something to eat and keep going. Mm-hmm. How bad is that for your digestion? And that's so oh. common. It was so, I did a study abroad in Spain in college. And it was like so weird for me. I mean, it wasn't an hour. It was like at least the the way our schedule it was like three hours. Like I was like, I was still learning Spanish. So my head was just like spinning that, you know, Spaniards have kind of like a fast accent. It's a little different than what I was used to from like my Mexican professors. But I was like, wow, we are really savoring. I mean, we have been sitting here for hours and like, it, but it's beautiful. I, it's so sad that we don't have that, you know, like we are so rushed, so rushed. So it's no wonder you're like scarfing food as fast as you can. That is cultural for us. And it's kind of sad. And no wonder there's so many digestive issues on top of just the, all the stuff you mentioned before with our, the state of our planet. And, um, and, and the blue zones are based on socialization or mm-hmm. exchanging with other people mm-hmm. more than just the food you're eating. Mm-hmm. That's one of the most fundamental keys, uh, key points for longevity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that hour gives you time for exchanging with other people, like having that social moment right. around your foods that in 15 minutes is impossible. You might say hi, goodbye. Right. That's it. Right. That's it. All the time. Yeah. <clears throat> I love that. Yeah. And finding joy in cooking, I think too, that there's something very therapeutic about like chopping vegetables, you know, and like just being, it's like a meditation practice too, which will bring you. <clears throat> more into your parasympathetic before you're going to eat. I feel like, cause you have that calming versus just hurry, order your food and let's go. Like you're so in the sympathetic, which is going to decrease your digestive process oh, yeah, as and well. And, and the other <laughs> thing that is being used a lot and um, we're in the modern, like in modern nutrition is, is getting lost. It's the spices. Um, mm, I love ginger, that. turmeric, um, mm-hmm. paprika, you name it, garlic. Um, well, garlic is not a spice really directly, but 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 the point is that yeah. spices are usually aiding agents for digestion, right. and a lot of cultures they use them because they know they are antibacterial. They, they they were in concern at that time, of course. There was no fridge in in every house, so mm-hmm. they need to keep the food stable. And uh, but also the the digestive process was optimized by using that blend of herbals and and botanicals. And on the side, botanicals are amazing for stimulating your digestive pathways. Mm -hmm. And they're very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we don't use on a regular basis. Uh, uh, Mint tea in the morning can start boosting your digestive system pretty well. Ginger, another big one. Um, So we can start using uh, herbal teas and... Uh, beaters, digestive beaters, 
I was joking. I, I remember it was with you that I will call my clinic bitters just because <laughs> I recommend them so much. I there so those are one of the most fundamental things that we have to use. You have more receptors for that than probably anything else in the body. Uh, really? Those are super abundant. And how wow. much? How many times in a year people eat bitters uh, or something with bitter taste? Almost never. Right. And they have a cleansing effect. People who are worried about their immune system, the beaters optimize the immune function. They have detoxification properties. There's a list of things that I can mention about digestive beaters. And the beauty of it is that they're incredibly inexpensive. You can yeah. get really good ones for a very cheap price. And so a lot of the solutions are actually pretty affordable and easy yeah. to do. Yeah, and then I'll add walking. <laughs> oh, yes. move a little bit it's like you got to it, it definitely helps like anybody who's run long distance knows that if you run enough you'll like literally liquefy everything in your inside so just think of a less extreme version of that and it just helps move things along <laughs> um all right um i think we'll go ahead and wrap that up here did you have anything else that you thought would be beneficial for people in terms of either the gut microbiome or the oral microbiome um i, I would like to mention just um Right now, um, I'm, we're seeing a huge connection between very serious conditions and uh, a translocation of microbes between the mouth and the gut. So when your digestive efficiency, and especially your stomach acid production is not optimal, you have that chance of translocating microbes from one side to another. And we didn't know that was such a huge deal. It was like, okay, that can disrupt your gut microflora, mm -hmm. can lead mm -hmm. to uh, forms of SIBO, and actually probably is one of the main sources to build uh, SIBO symptoms. Mm -hmm. But that was pretty much it. We didn't really saw more, much more implications than, than that. And now we know that a lot of severe conditions, including autoimmune and non-alcoholic fatty liver, and even some cancer uh, processes are started or aggravated by microbes, which can be translocating from the mouth to the gut. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's very important to take care of the oral microbiome. It's very important to take care of the gut microbiome, but it's also very important that our digestive pathways, the production of stomach acid, especially is optimal because mm -hmm. those two things they are very good for us, but where they belong. If they start getting translocated, that can start the perfect storm of multiple conditions that we want to avoid. So um, that that's even more, um, that's another benefit of getting a good uh, digestive efficiency. So you're saying, um, okay, let's say somebody's got, they got some halitosis going on, they got some bad breath and they're hearing this and they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously go to a biological dentist. I rec recommend, right. Find out what's actually going on with you or, you know, you could, you could, you could do remote or can you do, con you'd have to like be hands-on with somebody in that. Yeah. I, I yeah. You'd have to be okay. uh, hands-on. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can give recommendations of course, but um, yeah, right. definitely you, you need the hands-on part. Uh, okay. I mean, but you're saying like right. stomach acid is like, you're definitely going to want to make sure you have good stomach acid because that would basically, they can't survive the acidic environment of the stomach to get down into the intestines. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Or it makes um, it less likely for them to be able to. You have a so, filter, main, main filter. For, right. We, we swallow a lot of bacteria, a uh, hundred billion bacteria at least uh, per day from the mouth mm -hmm. into the gut. Mm -hmm. And they're not supposed to arrive alive. We okay. use them in a dead form, which is another conversation, but when they start arriving and colonizing or getting translocated, that's the problem. That's where you don't want to be. So your main recommendation on a general podcast way for making sure your stomach is acidic? <laughs> uh, take your time for eating. Uh -huh. Exercise exercises is huge, by the way, that mm. for optimizing your autonomic nervous system, mm. your autonomic nervous system is key for your stomach to produce acid, keep your um, nutrients uh, optimized. And if you have to, and there's nothing wrong with it, uh, taking multivitamin, magnesium, things like that are very needed for uh, the digestive pathways uh, functioning. Mm. And the other thing is 
um, take care of you the way you eat. Mm-hmm. Chew it slowly. Your all these grandma recommendations, like chew your food, take mm-hmm. your time. Right. Those actually work. <laughs> they were they were pretty accurate for what we need right now. Um, uh, don't focus that much on amount. Focus more on quality. Yeah, uh, your body can can take care of the rest, but quality is over quantity for sure. Yeah, I'd say. I mean, the healthiest people that I know and hang out with, I've never seen them give two shits about like <laughs> what their what their quantity of food is, but their qu- quality. Uh, that is going to be the best. It's going to oh, be yeah. the best that they can possibly get. And that's kind of how, in my opinion, that's like the people who have, are maintaining health for long periods of their life. That's how they think. It's just yeah. like, what's the qu- highest quality food that I can get? Not, I need to diet down and get skinny and all this stuff. <laughs> no, no the, the, the rest happens naturally. Yes. If you <laughs> quality and your body's optimal in their pathways, mm-hmm. that's all you need to take care of. The mm-hmm. rest will happen naturally. The body is designed for being healthy yes. and, and putting things in place. Uh, and, and we don't have to think about it. So mm-hmm. this overthinking about our diet or mm-hmm. what, what, how many grams of this or that mm-hmm. we're eating, actually I think is an added stress factor. Mm-hmm. What we should be doing really is sitting on our table, hopefully preparing our, our own meals and enjoying that moment. Mm-hmm. And, and if we have somebody on the side, even better, we can mm-hmm. have a beautiful conversation while you're eating. That will make your nutrition better by far, more than counting calories or grams of proteins or fats or anything else and driving yourself crazy and stressed, mm-hmm. trying to figure it out what's your perfect ratio of foods mm-hmm. that you need to eat. No, that's not going to work like that. The body will take care of that by, by itself. Mm-hmm. Um, just just enjoy meals that's it that's <laughs> thank you so much this has been so insightful um revolutiongothealth.com is your website i noticed that you also have like um education for like health professionals that want to learn more about the gut microbiome correct as part of that yeah. also can you tell what all your offerings are yeah i'm i'm offering right now um online um uh, coaching services for any person that wants to optimize their um their uh, gut status and any condition related to the gut microbiome nice. but also for practitioners that want to get more educated in treating more efficiently all these issues mm-hmm. um i have a, a uh, a program that I set up that is one-on-one, so it's fully customizable, and and you can adapt that to your needs. Because of course, maybe a chiropractor right. needs different things to emphasize their knowledge than uh, a dentist. So uh, I put this one-on-one program because I think that that's where you can customize things to your needs uh, in a more efficient way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's those two are offered uh, through my website. Awesome. And it's, that's awesome for me too, because sometimes people are like, Oh, I want to test my gut. And I'm like, I can't help you with that unless you want to go on a full mindset, coaching, life coaching, training, nutrition journey. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I just wanted to run a stool test. So I'll just send them your way (laughs) if that's all they want. Thank you so much. Um, We'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Yes, of course. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me.